great. Okay, so yeah, thanks, Leah. Thanks for asking me to come and speak today and share our journey with our safety planning intervention. I think it's fair to say it's been a fairly long journey, really valuable journey, uh, lots to learn, um, and I guess a bit of a marathon, certainly not a sprint. <laughs> um, and I thought the best place to start really was in the beginning, which is usually the best place. And I thought it'd be helpful to give some context within which our work began. Just trying to get it to move down, not moving down. I can't get the next slide to move for some reason. Um, do you want to just like, stop sharing and, and start again to see if it's a bit of an yeah. issue there? Otherwise, I can share them for you if need be. I'll try again. I'll just put it on. Um, Okay. We'll try again and then we have a copy of the slides anyway. So okay, no, that that's great. So I'm sharing the slideshow version. Yeah, still. So let me just try. Sorry, I'll try the other version just in case for some reason. Um okay. share screen. Ah, perfect. Okay. Well done. <laughs> Technology, you see. <laughs> yeah, every time. Always great when it works. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I thought I'd give some context really of, of where we started our, our journey. So considering our kind of internal drivers, what was going on for us in Mersey Care, us along with other trusts committed to a, a zero suicide ambition. And that was an aspirational goal, not a target. And we did this within... I think it was 2015 when we started and what we really wanted to do is standardize our practice and deliver quality suicide prevention care in a consistent way and to do that we set up something called the center for perfect care which as a psychologist i thought oh gosh can we call a can we call a center that um but actually what it is is a center for quality improvement and also innovation and it was set up to drive forward our um, aspirational goals really of which suicide prevention was one along with least restrictive practice. So we, we also wanted to really learn from our incidents, um, you know, sad deaths by, by suicide that we'd had within the organisation and where and how could we improve our care, what could we do differently and where should we start and the place that made the most sense to start was with regards to what we were doing for crisis planning, care planning, you know, how consistent were we and how close to the evidence base were we and what could we improve. So what we did was we, we did an internal audit looking at 100 of our crisis plans across the whole organisation and we benchmarked them against, you know, what national policy, evidence-based good practice was telling us we should be doing with regards to crisis planning and managing risk. And what we found was an awful lot of variation, uh, lots of excellent quality, but also somewhere it was clear that there was room for improvement, an example of which was where you might see at the bottom of crisis plan, does the service user agree with the plan? And it would say no. And then he would think, well, you know, that's not a crisis plan. So we realised we could improve. Also, we asked an academic to come in at the time and look at all of the, um, again, sad deaths that we'd had by suicide that went to coroners just to see how they'd been assessed. Um, and what we found was a disproportionate amount of people were actually assessed as low risk. So what we wanted to do based on this was to move towards a prevention goal for everybody um, and a, what better place to start really than developing a, a collaborative safety plan. With a view to what else was going on in the, the kind of broader political context, of course, the quality cost effective challenge um, was set out. So we knew that whatever we developed had to drive up quality, but also drive down cost. So we really wanted to maximise the skills uh, that we have in the NHS of the workforce, including people with lived experience, peer workers, assistant practitioners um, in what, what we developed. 
Personally, I always had, had an interest in safety planning, and that was started when I started my work as a nursing assistant um, quite a few years ago. Uh, so I've always had an interest in what happens when people leave hospital, what happens when they're discharged, how do we equip people, and why and how have they come back in and what's missing. So that was the starting point for me personally. So we began by setting up our team, um, the Safe Room Suicide team, of which there is four of us now. We've just become a larger trust, so that there's four of us who work within the team across the whole organisation. So it is a small team. We also work within our centre with quality improvement team and really closely with clinical operations across the divisions. When we started, we developed a strategy um, around these four pillars and 10 key interventions of which safety planning sat within the, the green first two elements of the interventions, which was to really co-design, utilise um, the resources that, that we had also within the workforce, but also the, the wealth of experience that people with lived experience brought right from the outset in the design. So off we went to uh, develop and design our, our safety plan. As I said, we benchmarked our crisis management against national guidelines. And we also did an extensive literature review at the time as to what was out there in terms of safety planning, crisis planning. There was very little in terms of safety planning. I think Stanley and Brown, as you mentioned, Leah, was um, the main um, evidence that was coming out of the literature. But there was policy and national guidelines, but also recovery um, literature. We then, on the basis of that, produced a set of standards in which to develop a safety plan. We developed a prototype with a guide um, and some accompanying resources. And then we engaged our service users and staff within the process right from the beginning. And the word all kind of captures what's been written in the literature, but also the outcome of our focus groups that we ran in our many meetings that we had with the people actively using our services and people who are working now as um, peers or people with lived experience. The research here that, that really influenced our um, development in the early days, uh, so forgive, you know, some of them are earlier, earlier papers, but still relevant because actually there is no safe place. And I think there was um, a misconception that if you admit somebody to hospital, that's the main risk strategy that we use. Whereas actually there is no safe place. Sometimes admitting someone to hospital is risk within itself. Um, so we knew that we really needed some safer collaborative strategies. Also that we wanted to target interventions that directly focused on suicidal coping rather than diagnostic group. In the beginning, people were saying, well, we just need to focus on, you know, developing perfect depression care. Um, and I was saying, well, you know, that um, that's not going to work because actually we know that um, decision to take your own life and, and some of those coping strategies around self-harm is trans-diagnostic. It goes across the piece. Some of the kind of clinical models, I suppose, using my bread and butter were obviously DBT approaches, CBT for suicide prevention, the um, CAMS, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicide uh, by Jobs, and then what was going on brief intervention wise. So there was some brief interventions emerging. There was also the, the Stanley and Brown work where they made recommendations that we built into our safety plan. We saw that effective interventions should have these common features, skills building, problem solving, that balance between um, autonomy, but able to seek support. And I was really reassured, actually, Leah, when you presented the, the evidence that's in the NICE guidelines around a, a good enough safety plan to see these things are, are very much up there. So even though we developed ours earlier, I think it's, it's really reassuring. And then we collated standards based on all of the above. I won't go through them all, but we developed 10, and this is what we will use as a, a kind of auditing process. So obviously it must be individually tailored, sensitive to context. It must have the ability to learn as well from previous crisis, so to help people learn what was going on for me. Why did I end up in that place? Given the same scenario again, what can I do differently? And of course, it, it is aimed at self-management in the first place, but also needing to help people access their strengths, which we know is um, can be really difficult 
uh, when people are feeling at certain points in their lives. So problem solving, solution generating, core feature um, and a standard for safety planning. And also be guided by the service user, taking time, um, allowing for other people's views of significant other people uh, in the person's life and what works well and maybe what doesn't help. So these are the key areas that we, we built our prototype. Problem solving, key feature, making sure we get the right solution for the problem. Sometimes what you see in safety plans is a, an emphasis on distraction. And there is definitely a place for distraction, but it isn't um, it isn't the kind of panacea, it isn't the be all and end all. And sometimes people struggle to even contemplate that in that particular place. So it's really important that we consider all the things that make somebody vulnerable and develop solutions that actually fit uh, the, the problems that's underlying the despair that people are feeling. And hope and resilience is a, a strong feature that we wanted to develop in our safety plan. So this is a snapshot from our training. It, it just gives you an idea of, of what are the sections that we ended up building into our safety plan. And I'll, I'll show you what it looks like later. So as I said, planning head section, really important. Um, and I think this is this in the hope section is potentially what distinguishes our safety plan from some others um, that I've seen um, and that are, are out there for people, people to use. And the planning ahead section is really about scenario planning. You know, given what is it that people are worried about? What scenarios do they dread? What symptoms can they not manage? What relationship circumstances cause them distress and then lead to particular kinds of coping? Really getting an exhausted list and then making sure we map the solutions onto that particular problem. And when we do that, that instills hope because people then can say, oh, right, OK, I can try that for that. I can now try that for that. And with our uh, safety plan, we've built a re self-help resource booklet that captures all the kinds of um, difficulties that people might face if that might lead them actually to, to contemplate taking their own life. And then the hope section was actually recommended by Stanley and Brown's work that this should be included as a, a matter of course in all safety planning. And they found that that was one of the recommendations from one of their studies. So we tested it and uh, we did a number of PDSAs. PDSAs is, is just a term for a quality improvement cycling approach uh, with that kind of rapid learning turnaround. We tried an inpatient straight away. Um, we utilised the adverse effects questionnaire just to make sure we certainly didn't want to do anything harmful with our prototype. We did a thematic analysis of the service user's experience of using the safety plan. And then we, we realised in this short PDSA that people needed a little bit of orientation and training as to how to deliver the safety plan in the most effective way. So we devised some training um, and found that there was, there was no adverse effects. Then what we wanted to do is, is trial inpatient, but also a, a community stepped up care service, which at the time was how we were delivering our crisis services. We repeated the adverse effects questionnaire and also wanted to hear what was it like as a, as a member of staff? Did it seem feasible? Was it something that they could do? Did they feel equipped to do it? Was the training suitable, et cetera? So what we did find is that when you're delivering the safety plan and intervention, it's really important to be led by the service user and where they are uh, and how able they are to collaborate at that point in time. What we didn't want people to do is say offered but refused and that's that done with. So we wanted to encourage people to offer a number of different times and actually document that that, that was what they were doing and more than more often than not, we found that second or third time people were in agreement to collaborate with the safety plan. There's some examples of some of the feedback that we got. People felt it raised insight. Our service users felt it helped them really understand and, and felt hopeful that there were things that they could do. Um, and also it, it made them feel comfortable doing it with a staff member. Staff feedback, uh, some of the things in here. People said, actually, this is what I went into nursing to do. Um, I was really glad to do the intervention, learned lots about the person, strengthened the alliance, 
Uh, so all in all, it was positive from those first PDSA cycles. So then what we needed to do is go broader, because if we were going to assess the feasibility, safety and acceptability of it in, as usual, we needed to have some measures, we needed to increase the sites that we were um, implementing. So we had uh, two inpatient wards and two stepped up care teams and a number of measures. So how did we get on and where are we with it all now? So the PDSA findings and successes, we found in that um, three month implementation period, there was 0% readmission to that inpatient ward. We found there was a reduction in A&E presentation, reduction in complaints actually from service users, which was a, an unintended positive outcome, um, we, which I guess is evidence that people were getting better care um, and a better service user experience whilst they were um, on those wards and in the communities. We found with our measures that it had a positive impact on alliance, increased the locus of control that people felt, and also their sense of being able to cope, um, their emotional coping, use the dares at the time. And then our qualitative um, analysis showed um, overwhelmingly positive response really from service users and staff, and we didn't find any adverse effects. So we realised that operating out of um, using a prevention tool, targeting everybody, um, this is was the way forward for us rather than um, people who we thought may be at high risk. There were some challenges. Uh, it is a culture shift. I think when you're doing a collaborative safety plan that's owned by the service user um, compared to following through on your risk assessments, getting your crisis plan done, your care plan, that's very much feels like the practitioner's paperwork. And when we spoke to service users, they often said, actually, yeah, it feels like that sometimes. Um, so it is a culture shift. There is something about ownership by senior management and also being able to adapt to context. So we, we realised that working in an urgent care setting, we needed something that perhaps was in a briefer format, format but had the same content and the same process in delivering it. We also had specialist LD services um, and we, need, we knew that we needed to adapt that um, in order to, to, to meet the needs of the clinical population. We then did some participation work, <coughs> excuse me, with our um, non-LD ASD um, service and, and they looked at it and I'd be really interested to hear uh, about Emma's work actually so we, we did some developments there and more recently older people and children and young people services as they come into our, our service. Really crucial is accurate reporting, monitoring uh, and regular feedback to teams. When we did this we almost generated a kind of healthy competition really across wards. Uh, people like, oh gosh, you know, they've got nearly 70% of the people on their wards have got a safety plan. We need to, we need to improve. Um, so that kind of regular monitoring is really helpful. We came across something where um, inpatient staff were delivering the safety plan at the point of discharge. And this was leading to all kinds of problems with people feeling like it was something that was just done to them before they were then sent out. So we needed to really look at and work quite closely with our, our MDTs in inpatient settings to say, listen, the earlier you do this, the more it informs the inpatient stay. It will also tell you a bit about the formulation of, of the difficulty, but also what needs to happen in order for this person to be discharged from the ward safely. So we, we had some um, discussions, built an implementation guide as well to, to support people with this. And just to say at the end, you know, it is certainly a marathon and not a, a sprint and managing some of the expectations of trust board, you know, at the pace at which we were embedding this in the system. So where we are now, we have got the safety plan um, offer. So everybody, 100% of our service users should be offered a collaborative safety plan. This is built in to our, um, what we call our quality committee. It's an expectation, it's in our operational plan. We built an e-learning module because at the time there was just me trying to train 8,000 staff in a half day training. So 
that wasn't going to work. So we built a, a module and subsumed that in a broader package called effective risk intervention skills. So that's our e-risk training and safety planning uh, has its own module. This training is mandatory and it's also competency based so we can keep an eye on the quality. We have new services um, in the trust, particularly in adult mental health settings, who have the safety plan intervention as a stepped entry intervention. So that plus some psychoeducational work before you go on to further therapeutic work. So that, again, is em embedding and building it into those service structures. We make sure our e-risk training and um, safety planning progress is monitored right up to the exec board and also local operations and down to teams on the ground. Um, and what we are in a position now to actually further the research um, for a feasibility study, possibly a randomised control trial of the use of this safety plan. Um, so certainly be interested to, to, if there's anyone here to collaborate on that. Almost um, just coming to the end now, this is our spruced up version now of our uh, safety planning guide, the actual safety plan, information for significant others, service user guide and our self-help resources. And you can see module four is the safety plan module. And as I said at the beginning, we wanted to simultaneously improve the skills in assessment within our organisation whilst upping the opportunity to do preventative activities for both self-harm and, and suicide. Looks a complicated slide, but this is just some of the monitoring that goes into our local safety huddles, you know, percentage of staff trained, how many safety plans are being offered. Um, <clears throat> and what we want to do now is further understand what does good look like? So there might be 40 safety plans offered that month in that team, but what's the size of the caseload of that team? So what's the proportion and how can we improve? There's our growth um, over the, you know, from 2016 when we started the, the actual implementation right up to where we are now. Uh, you can see we are getting there um, and this is something we report regularly. Um, you know, up to our to our board and, and in many discussions that we have. So where are we going next? Our next strategy really is um, what we would call a system wide approach, and it includes the workforce for suicide prevention and self-harm. And it's a synthesis of necessary components of effective suicide prevention care and the learning that we, we had from our first phase. It's on our website if you want to, to read more about it. And the focus really of this is it's as much on interventions as it is on systems and processes uh, to work towards increased reliability. And we've got our immediate action plan for this next year. Um, you can see we want to extend our brief interventions beyond safety planning and really do some focusing on transitions <clears throat> and also understand our population using larger um, intelligence and data sets. And we continue to have lived experience um, right at the heart of everything that we do. And this is where we're going this year. So safety planning now sits within our e-risk training. Transition is the next one, uh, which is a set of key things to do to enable a safe landing when people move within and out of services. Five, five questions and safe structure are about improving the quality. So we have a co-design model for safe structure, which sits on the NHS England's future space called PRISM. And we have a one page safety flashcard, along with a compassionate text follow up that we are um, introducing in A&E. So thank you so much. I know it's a whistle stop tour, but hopefully that gives you a feel for where we've been and where we're going. <laughs>